Uh, good morning. So, um, thanks very much for uh, the uh, invitation to be here and the excellent organisation. Privileged to be the first talk. Uh, so, I'm um, going to give a little bit of an outline of some of the, a little bit of a review, as best I can, of uh, some of the theoretical algorithmic <coughs> developments <coughs> in this area. So, <coughs> the topic actually in this form, as, as Chris has described it, of uh, multiple modalities and uh, multiple images that have some cross information is relatively new. Uh, as I'll show you, uh, there was some uh, literature in the uh, geophysics community uh, that, we took, that we looked at, but really um, we started looking into this uh, around about <coughs> when the PetMR uh, facility was developed at UCL and we started to, to look at what methods there were. And it was relatively small, but it has grown a, a tremendous amount uh, in the last uh, six, seven years, I would say. So I'm, I'm always wondering how to structure this, but this is roughly how I'm structuring it. Um, and uh, we're, of course, here going to talk about uh, medical applications. So we'll mention this uh, review from 2008 by Dave Townsend, talking about multimodality imaging. So, so uh, SPECT and CT, PET and CT, uh, been around a relatively long time, uh, but in the last 10 years there's been this development of PET-MR, which has uh, a lot of exciting opportunities because of the <coughs> contrasting, <laughs> strongly contrasting structural and functional information, more so than you would say in uh, CT-PET or CT-SPEC. Uh, I'm going to just give, this is a very, very brief <coughs> set of examples. I, I it was uh, described it was impossible to be very comprehensive. But what I um, actually took these from, uh, since we began our own research in this area, we um, decided to uh, run a special issue of inverse problems. That's uh, what it's been publishing over the last couple of years and now just completed. So uh, I've taken these examples mostly from what's published in there. I've got the full citation list at the end. <coughs> and um, the, many of the authors as, uh, of uh, many of these papers are here in this uh, symposium, so can, apologies if I misrepresent you, but uh, also you have the opportunity to uh, discuss it further during the, during the next few days. Um, so PETMR is, is a sort of a flagship modality that we've been promoting. Uh, Matthias Erhardt, most of you, uh, know, uh, many of you know, uh, developed um, a particular technique which um, became reasonably influential, I would say, uh, based on a, on a geometric coupling of images. Also work by uh, the Munster group, Eva is here, and I think there'll be at least one talk discussing that and uh, extensions involving a machine learning type uh, kernelized versions of whatever he's referred to. Uh, nevertheless, in PETMR, we would say uh, two modalities, two complementary, they're more or less linear. Of course, neither is strictly linear. Uh, MR, if you solve, try to solve from the block equation, is not truly linear, but it, we all know that in practice it's most often treated with a Fourier transform and PET via um, uh, just line integrals if we ignore attenuation and proximity. So these are two modalities which are linear. Maybe it's the easiest example of what we are trying to do. Another example, <coughs> I was looking for examples where we had nonlinearity. Uh, there's this recent work by Matthews and Anastasio uh, where they couple ultrasound tomography, ultrasound CT, which is a nonlinear tomography problem in reconstructing sound speed, and photoacoustic tomography, which is a linear modality uh, reconstructing uh, initial pressure. And uh, in that paper, they have uh, a kind of alternating technique where they uh, iterate between solving the um, 
photoacoustic tomography problem and the ultrasound problem. But uh, relinearizing using a full wave organization. Then multispectral CT, there's many talks going to be presented on that here. The difference there is we have not just two, uh, we might say it's a single modality, but it uh, has multiple channels. So some of the arguments are purely based on joint uh, geometric considerations. Uh, not so easy to apply there. Uh, Multispectral CT might be treated linearly, if you think of it as just a set of coupled radon transmitting exertions, but they are coupled in a nonlinear way uh, through the uh, material components and their spectral sensitivities. So there are several different approaches which may be taken there uh, between linear and nonlinear approaches. You can also do, you can do it either uh, purely in the data space, so un unmixing the channels in the data space followed by a linear reconstruction, <coughs> or uh, we can do a linear reconstruction followed by unmixing in the image space, or we can do it in a kind of joint fashion. And in fact, uh, I believe Emil will be talking about that one next. And then in MR, there are techniques which you might call multifactorial parametric MR, or the term MR fingerprinting, where we have multiple channels. And here we really are addressing uh, the nonlinearity of MR because we're trying to find the relaxation parameters and other uh, density information uh, direct, directly from the block equation. Uh, then we can also consider uh, time series, as Chris mentioned. <coughs> you can either think of uh, dynamic imaging as a kind of just a time series in 3D, or you can think of each time point as a separate channel which are also coupled. So in this paper, uh, also by the Munster group, they uh, look at the problem of uh, a temporal relaxation, uh, a t temporal regularization, which is uh, enhanced by a high resolution structural model. And then finally, uh, th it's very appropriate to keep in mind, I mean, we're, uh, by, by construction, this is a mixed community. Uh, that's part of the reason behind uh, having so people different backgrounds here. Uh, but even outside medical, outside material tomography, there are other areas. So in geophysics is perhaps the prima facie example of that. So several of the, the ideas from Haber and Holtzman and Garsick in 2014 predate some of the work uh, we've done. And also in the special issue, there's a, a rather interesting review article uh, talking about multi-physics approaches. So in, in geophysics, you have uh, typically a, a acoustic measurements, uh, which uh, look into reconstruct sound speed, but you also have electrical measurements looking to reconstruct permittivity and others. And there's several interesting ideas. I won't actually go through the detail in this talk there about how to um, use joint structural and um, learned mappings between different complementary information. Okay, so what are the, the challenges? Why is this sort of scientifically uh, worth um, our attention? Well, uh, Chris hinted at a couple of things. We, we have uh, multiple data. They are incommensurate. We have um, radio frequency signals from MR. We have uh, photon counts uh, from PET. Uh, they're not in the same physical dimensions. We customarily consider the likelihoods so we uh, undimensionalize them by um, scaling by the inverse covariance of the data so they become dimensionless. Nevertheless, there exist scalings which, which in theory are easy to handle but in practice are very hard to handle uh, about what is the relative weightings between data of different, um, coming from different uh, physical processes. And <coughs> if we are doing uh, inverse problems, we almost always have to consider the use of regularization, which in the Bayesian framework means priors. So when we have multiple priors, prior imposed on a PET image, on an MR image, on a, a sound speed image and a pressure image, uh, again, they have to be scaled. So theoretically, we uh, make them dimensionless by uh, applying the inverse of the covariance of the uh, property. But the inter-property covariance is much harder to assess. And then there are perhaps uh, 
two main different approaches overall that we would take, though we might take the, the expectation that we have a robust information from one modality, which is just being used to inference the other. <coughs> so what we might call a one-sided approach. Uh, but the alternative is to, is to simultaneously reconstruct both at once. And then we might uh, consider whether we alternate between them <coughs> or whether we, uh, in the higher dimensional problems, whether we cycle through priority. So those are all uh, academically interesting sort of research questions. Uh, so let's just put the setting a little bit more formally there. So I'm going to, in most of this talk, just consider the case of two modalities and not the case of multiple modalities. But I can make a few comments, perhaps, if we have time during the questions about that. So <coughs> you think of two, two modalities. Uh, we say an image U and an image V. And uh, sort of use, use the color red for mapping one. So we measure from the uh, image space. There's no pointer here, is there? No? Is this? OK, never mind. Um, we go from the image space is projected to a data space. And so this likelihood term is some uh, functional with those two parameters which operates in the data space and as we know it's interpreted as a negative log likelihood of the probability of obtaining the data given the image u and the same thing for uh, image uh, modality 2. So if we combine them together we should uh, strictly speaking talk about the uh, negative log likelihood of Oh, sorry, the, yeah, the negative log likelihood of, the, of getting this joint data, UU, GV, given the joint state, U and V. And we can represent that simply, we can just stack these operators. There they are. That's the support operator in bold A, meaning the stack of these two, F, the stack of these two, and V, the stack of these two. And that could be done for many more, more uh, data uh, measurements than just two. And as already mentioned, they, they can be linear or non-linear. And also, we would, you know, we customarily uh, divide problems into whether they're well-posed, like <coughs> inverse Fourier transform is a well-posed problem, weakly ill-posed, such as CC, which has a polynomial decay in the spectrum, or strongly ill-posed, such as uh, problems in recovering permittivity from electrical. But when we consider the um, regularized solution, we normally talk about a posterior estimate. So uh, that means that we take uh, the product of the likelihood of the data and the prior on the image. And when taking the negative log of that, again, this familiar idea of the negative log posterior, which we would say is the posterior of obtaining the pair UV given the data GU, GV. In the likelihood terms, it's the sum of those two in the log. Uh, but this regularization term, psi, uh, could depend jointly on the two modalities. Uh, let me qualify w what I just said. Of course, you may say, what about the, um, isn't, there, isn't there some joint uh, covariance in the data? Yes, technically there could be. Oops. Oh, it's that, it was going so well. <laughs> if it is, oh dear, if it isn't fixed, if it isn't broken, I don't. Okay, I'll take it on. I don't mind. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Yes, technically there could be some uh, correlation in the data as well if, if, if one measurement is, uh, is, is conditioned on another measurement. We won't, uh, I won't discuss that here. This is the meaning of the joint reconstruction. The one-sided reconstruction I mentioned where we say, for example, that image V is reliably constructed, reconstructed, and we have a robust measurement of that, then we would simply say our task is to reconstruct U conditioned on data G and image V. 
And then we don't have to consider this term, we just consider this term. Uh, now we would say that the regularization has uh, conditioned u on v. I got the slightly wrong version of the slide. But anyway, um, and a basic tool is to use a descent method. So we say that we're going to iterate uh, reconstructing f by uh, its current state and an update. And the update is, in the simplest thing, just the descent direction, which you get by the gradient of the likelihood plus the gradient of the prior. And then we may also use quasi-Newton methods, so we take this descent direction and <coughs> apply a uh, at least non-negative definite operator Q, uh, which ideally would be the some approximation to the Hessian or some maybe some non-negative definite approximation to the Hessian um, of the negative log posterior, which, which we may sometimes be able to construct, but it's often quite expensive to do. And then um, current sort of optimization strategies usually consider rather than just a descent in both uh, terms of the likelihood and the prior, you do a, some kind of splitting method. So for example, we do a likelihood update step just by considering the change in the likelihood. And then we do a step here, which we could variously call a proximal projection but more generally, uh, some kind of image-based operator. It's just something which works with the image and corrects it. So for example, we do a, a reconstruction which creates artifacts and then we uh, apply an image filtration step or indeed a, a machine learning-based step uh, for correction of errors introduced by updating only the likelihood. And <coughs> One of the classes that is quite popular, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about, is this uh, idea that this step here is the evolution of a partial differential equation. So we are just considering, that, so we're taking an update step in the likelihood, for example, think of that as a back projection, a generalized kind of back projection of the data. And then uh, an evolution, we take that step, which is kind of contains some artifact, and then we evolve it through PD to correct artifacts introduced by back projection. Um, that this, once you have this idea, this, this step here may not be, strictly speaking, variational, may not be a Bayesian step, it could just be some generalized uh, image enhancement step. So uh, a nice recent approach by Elad's group considers this in a formal sense. Um, it is just a denoising operator and puts this into a formal framework where you can put any denoising operator uh, for the correction of this back projection step. Okay, let me um, move on. Ah, okay, oh, that's a here. So then a couple of more um, sort of key ideas that crop up. This idea of, of a Markov random field. So let's take... Uh, Let's just, uh, just take one image, U, and consider the pixels in it, U, I, and U, J. And then let's say that there's some generalized weighting, W, I, J, which represents in a general way the sort of confidence or the probability we have that uh, this pixel and this pixel are related. So if there's no, if they're, we, they're completely decorrelated, we set it to zero. Typically, we might put an upper limit on this of one so that when you have, we can have this probabilistic interpretation. Uh, we uh, base that on the difference of the values. We can generalize that a little bit. I'll show you in a moment. We can generalize that to difference of features of values. So we'll put another step in there. But we, and we include this uh, power as a way of controlling the uh, influence or the dependence on the strength of you. And then we have this neighborhood. So we're taking this uh, weighting up to some uh, neighborhood relation with from one pixel to another. Um, and then so the gradient of this is easy to write. 
uh, it just depends on the difference to the tau p minus 1 and which weight you look in. And then in certain cases, we can see this simplifies to various other uh, forms that we recognize. So if the power is 2, then uh, we can rewrite this in this form as the inner product U L U, and L is a generalized matrix <coughs> uh, whose components are these weightings when an off-diagonal and the uh, diagonal is the sum of the off-diagonal terms. That means that the application of L to a constant will always be zero because the each row will add to zero. So for example, if the neighborhood is just four connected pixels, and the weighting is one, then we arrive at just uh, the conventional mathematical Laplace, which is a famous uh, stencil of a one, 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 minus four. But when we increase this neighborhood, uh, let's say this neighborhood becomes the whole image, this becomes what's known as the graph Laplacian. But the same uh, m machinery applies, it just may become computationally slightly more com onerous because we're dealing with just more we don't have a very sparse operation operator here. And then in between this, we can define a neighborhood to have a slightly larger scale. It might have a spatial Gaussian weighting or be patch based. Uh, but the, a large number of regularization in the discrete setting fit into this idea. And then getting back to the idea of uh, the multimodality, the idea is then to design these weightings to reflect the influence of the image V, which let's say the uh, image V is the known one, uh, we want to reflect the probabilities that we think by design uh, affect the relationship of this weighting. So, you know, if, uh, if, w I, if uh, image V, for example, has a strong edge at one point, we would say that it's likely there's a strong edge in image U. And this, this framework includes this one in Bausch's prior, where we design these weightings to have some statistical similarity in patches. And again, in this, I don't want to go through all the details of Bausch's prior and its variations. We started at 850, right? So, yeah. And then the last kind of concept that is uh, very uh, highly used in solving problems is the idea of sparsity and the basic idea is that from the image F, sorry, perhaps I should have put U here as the image F, we have some sparsity transformation, which I represent by E, into some other variable uh, psi and the corresponding uh, inverse transform if it's possible to get it. Uh, and then the idea is that um, in this space, many coefficients are zero or close to zero. So the perhaps a very familiar known one is the wavelet transform. In your phone, if you uh, store a picture, uh, we don't store it as a thousand set by a thousand pixels with uh, 24 bits. Uh, it's transformed, it's compressed through wavelet transform. Very small components are thrown away and we have this very um, economical representation Strictly speaking, that's described by counting the number of non-zeros, which is what we call the L0 norm. But when we put this in an optimization framework, when we set this as a, into the, as a prior, or uh, we design a prior based in this setting, uh, this leads to very highly non-convex problems, strictly speaking, NP hard to optimize. So it's usually replaced by this L1 norm in that case. And then in this setting, it includes just putting uh, finite differences here, like in the Markov Reynolds field, uh, which means that we interpret psi, uh, psi just as the gradient of this. But of course, it can be much more generalized and through higher order derivatives uh, and non local uh, information if the uh, neighborhood of the transform is larger. But uh, so we saw from finite differences, wavelets are very popular. We can use the machine learning uh, framework by saying that this is like a, a kernel. So these, these are the uh, representations in kernel space. Or indeed, you can interpret this now as an encoder and a decoder in neural net. So we say that we uh, uh, learn a neural net that uh, represents the image through encoding here, sparsity defined here, decoding 
And then the typical inverse problem in this setting is what we, we call a synthesis approach. There's another approach called analysis approach, but we just say that we now have set the framework in terms of this latent variable psi. We take the L1 norm to impose the sparsity in that framework, and then the forward mapping is represented by applying the decoder or the inverse transform to psi and uh, passing it through the forward operator. Um, and again, we, we will hear a lot more about the sort of machine learning interpretation of this approach, I think, in the session later today. What about the joint problem? Well, then the various people have then ap approached the question of designing joint sparsity. So, of course, one can just simply take the L1 norm, we can simply apply this transform to each modality and then take the L1 norm of each separately. Or you can take the uh, co-transform between two modalities, then take the length of the vector in the transform space, the L2 norm of that, and then apply the sparsity to the joint. And this means that we, you get a more compact relationship if the coefficients overlap in the transform space. So, for example, we applied a wavelet transform to a PET image and an MR image, and we say that we're looking for low coefficients which are uh, jointly represented at that scale and that uh, shift in the wavelet space, favored over ones which are not correlated. And then one last uh, comment I'll make, which is, is, a, is um, applicable to some of the multi-channel informations, uh, is uh, the multi-channel cases is to uh, take um, the images as a uh, product over the image uh, pixel value, pixel position, and the channel, and then look for a low rank representation of that. Um, that means that that's a globalized measure, which is just simply saying that um, there are only a few independent components overall in the image, which um, is uh, something you can argue, for example, in um, multispectral CT, is that we are looking for uh, material components of with, with only a, a small set of possible values. That idea is also in one of the papers in the special issue. That was uh, generalized to the case where you take low rank plus sparse within patches as well. So once this framework is set up, you can think of many variations. Okay, so let's look at um, this idea of uh, the regularization as a PDE. So I'll speed up a little bit. This is fairly standard. For a single image, we're taking the uh, gradient as a sparse prime transform, then applying some local, uh, just some ordinary valued function to it. We define the functional in this way. So this is exactly the same in the discrete setting as the Markov random field, we take the difference of pixels and then the power P, that's one example of that, but this is now in the continuous setting, so we're formally realizing that the um, local difference is the gradient. Then when, the, when you differentiate this, we get this format as the divergence of a diffusivity applied to the image. So this looks like a diffusion equation when you consider the image evolution. And then there are a uh, long, long list, this all fairly uh, well established and there are many, many more that how do you choose this function? You just choose it in different ways. We get a catalog of different possible diffusive flows. I won't, uh, for various reasons, there's, some, there's lots of technical reasons why you choose between having a smooth version of PV or a strict version of PV, which is strictly non-differentiable zero. But that's, that's a little more than we need to discuss here. And then there's another uh, uh, interpretation that's used in image processing in terms of what's called a structure tensor, where we don't formally consider differentiating some functional, we just look at the flow. And we say that the change in the image is uh, the change in the gradient, and then a term that looks like this, where we have uh, a system built from the image properties. We take the gradient and it's transpose and smooth it. That's representable in this form here. We take an eigen decomposition of this to get directions which are approximately 
normal and parallel to uh, the level sets of emission. It's called the edge enhancer diffusive flow, but it's notable it's not differentiated from some of the realization function. It's just an image processing step. <coughs> okay, so in the limit where the smoothing scale becomes zero, this strictly becomes the normals of the level set and the tangents of the level set. I'll uh, move from that because I want to get to some other details. Okay. So uh, what about a, a different alternative? It's looking at the statistics or the joint statistics of image. We're getting away from the geometric idea. Uh, we can look at uh, various measures, various information theoretic measures, typically one being the joint entropy. So this is something that's used uh, for a long time in registration of images. We have two images of completely different types, CTMR, for example. And our, our task is to uh, find a transformation which, which doesn't have to be linear, some sort of warping of one image into the other. And how do you assess the success of it? And then one way is to look at this joint entropy. So formally, the joint entropy is, is defined in this way, uh, depending on this joint probability density function. So how do you construct that? It's simply... Uh, just the map in the value of u and value of v, the co-occurrence of pixels, uh, very similar joint values, gives a high joint probability. Um, as I mentioned, joint entropy, there's, there's uh, another form of that uh, called mutual information, which considers um, the difference between the joint and the marginal ent entropy, but that doesn't appear to be... Uh, appropriate for use in reconstruction. So we simply take the regular, regularization value to be this joint entropy. So our task now is to reconstruct the images so that the joint entropy is minimized. Um, this, putting this in optimization step is much more complex uh, because it's very, very non-convex. But it is... Um, it can be actually perfectly computationally fast by using uh, Pars and Kerner's density estimators and regridding them onto a regular grid. We can find the, then we just need to differentiate the kernel density estimators, which are just analytic, and we um, can obtain a fast descent method for the probability, but of course it's still non convex. So, just to show what that means, if you take the image here, so <coughs> this is a Synthetic example, uh, uh, sort of MRI type image, and uh, sort of uh, blurred PET type image, or some image which has uh, missing the differentiation between the um, grey and white matter. Now we just look at the uh, joint distribution. So we just take uh, pairs of image. So this is a ground truth, and we take the uh, pairs between here and here, here and here, here and here. And in this blurry image, they're a little bit uh, distorted because the distribution of values corresponding to this image uh, map to the same pixel values. In this sharpened image, they're more uh, compact and compacted. So again, this is related to sparsity. We'd say this is, this is a more sparse representation in this joint histogram step. So our task in these methods is to reconstruct uh, this image such essentially this joint density estimation sharpens up in some sort of well-defined sense. Just briefly, this is a bit of an old slide. It shows uh, an idea <coughs> uh, working on a slightly different sort of setting, so unfortunately notation a little bit different. Uh, imagine we had uh, two images. They form a joint feature space, and we can then apply machine learning method to classify this let's say classify into four classes, we can then construct our diffusivity operator uh, by the um, relationship, uh, the probabilistic relationship between the segmented classes. Uh, and this is like a fuzzy segmentation, so they don't have to be exactly segmented. So we iterate the diffusivity, so we now then flow the image, this is now the uh, diffusivity, uh, different uh, setting different uh, notation, call it conductance. 
So this is the diffusivity we referred to before. Where this diffusivity is, this is between zero and one, where it's close to zero, the image will not flow. Where the image is, uh, where the value is one, the image flows. So the, the idea in that scheme is that we then put, uh, update the image so that uh, this feature space becomes more compact. All right, let's now, uh, well, those are the main things. So let's look a little bit closer at this idea of a fixed prior and this geometric orientation. So one of the influential papers comes from 1999 where it was used uh, for the uh, electrical impedance tomography form, which is a, a highly uh, ill-posed and not easy one. So let's go back to this setting where we had this um, functional defined in terms of the gradient. And now let's put a, a tensor field here and closing a directional weighting on the gradient. So if this is symmetric, uh, it can be decomposed uh, into uh, this set. We can say it's the outer product of L and it's transpose. So we think of this as the gradient and some kind of rotation and scaling of the gradient direction of the view. So we can write that as a, a generalized kind of derivative with a locally varying direction. So this rotation matrix is just depends on the local normal and the local tangent. And this uh, gamma is then a, an isotropic weight. So if we make this value gamma zero, then we take away any variation, any flow in the normal direction, and we only allow tangential flow. And the point is that in this setting, this, this orientation of this tensor is dependent on this other image V. In other words, if we take the level sets of this image V, we construct this, uh, uh, we, we build this construction so that uh, we are influencing this image to uh, have its normals of its level set in a similar direction to the normals of this image V. And then gamma is just an edge indicator, so you can, we don't have to set it to zero, one. And as I mentioned, so this becomes a local coordinate determined by the uh, local, the image itself, U, and this rotation which depends on the other image R. So the diffusion flow looks, looks like this. We take the gradient, rotate it, scale it, unrotate it, and take its square zero. Uh, another idea is to use a locally weighted norm. So we just go back to this formulation like something like TV or a smooth TV, and then we just add this weighted variation here. So it ends up looking fairly similar, uh, except we now have this diffusivity generated from uh, the image we're reconstructing and another one which comes from the prior, just multiplied together. And then finally we can generalize that idea uh, of the anisotropic tensor field by applying this local functional here we end up with something very similar. We have this, except this looks slightly different. We have the rotated those coordinates. The scaling is now split. And this diffusivity depends on uh, this applied to the rotated frame B. So this is now just a, a matrix tensor reorientation of the uh, directions of the image set U. So finally, let's talk about this. Uh, joint reconstruction framework that uh, Matthias developed. Going back to this idea of the level sets, <coughs> now we, we think we want to work, work with both images variants. So now we have the level sets of one image, the level sets of another image. So in the previous setting, what we were doing was saying, let's say this image is known. We know the normal and the tangent, and we construct that operator B. And then when we're reconstructing this image, we take its direction set the gradient and we rotate it according to what the other image is set. But if we look at this uh, setting jointly now, we can construct this uh, measure of the uh, parallelism between the level sets by taking the cosine theta uh, of the magnitude of U and B. We could equally well, we could take the um, vector product between the directions, the blue and red directions, and just take the length of that 
Nobody would have a sign for him here, so we'd have to take one minor sign. That was the idea in the paper by Hazel. And then uh, we construct this um, distance metric by generalizing a little bit, taking this uh, function, which just depends on the values of the magnitude of u and v in this function psi, and then this inner product that we just mentioned. But we'd have to take the magnitude of this inner product because we want to uh, not we want, uh, we want to prevent the idea that it would be the same or, or that it would depend on the uh, direction. In other words, we, if, you, if you take this image here, let's say we invert the colors, this would flip the direction of the normal. So if we just took this in a product, we said something in the chain. So we want to make it independent, as far as possible, of any intensity transformation on, on this image. So it's purely geometric. So that requires us to take this magnitude here, 0.56. So this is what the level set prior is set up to be, published in uh, this paper by Jack Smith. And it, broadly speaking, has the same setting. It's a functional here. We, we can differentiate it, but it straight becomes uh, non-convex. But the interesting thing is that if you, if you consider it, uh, it sets up in exactly the frame that we had before where we, uh, sorry, slightly misaligned here. We take, uh, for the flow of image U, we take the gradient, we take a rotation that depends on V, and this parameter lambda, which depends on U and V, and this K, which we had before, and then rotate it back. So what you're seeing is that we're creating two flows where U is influenced by V and V is influenced by U, and this term here, is given by this expression here. It's a diagonal matrix, and it's symmetric in U and V. So they have the same nature. And then, I uh, don't want to go through it here, we can, using the setting, uh, d invoke or impose different kinds of um, norms of, uh, uh, with, uh, in the spirit of finding the difference between an L1 constrained TV or a smooth TV or a quadratic uh, regularization. So this allows quite a general setting that we can play with. Okay, and so finally, um, taken from that same paper, this is just showing a couple of examples of PET and MR. So this is uh, MR with, sorry, the quality of this isn't great, with different uh, radial undersampling. So this is more radially unsampled. Uh, and this is, the first line is where we take uh, just the PET and the MR images reconstructed with no prior information, with TV, with joint TV, and different instantiations of this level set prior. Uh, and the, the things to note is there, there are some differences in the image. So, for example, this object here is present in the PET image and not in the MR image. And uh, as Chris said, we want to prevent the use of this joint prior, imposing false information. So uh, this, we found that um, uh, this particular setting seemed to perform optimally in that way. Okay, so to conclude, um, I wanted to a little bit survey things on the many, many things that I leave out. Apologies if you're in the room and you, I didn't address your particular methods. Um, I wanted to, to introduce the idea of an interpretation of the cross information geometrically or statistically or possibly both. I spent a little bit of time talking about some of our work on the variational approach uh, where we derive this diffusion setting, which is, can be fairly general. And then I, I said a little bit about combining statistics and geometry by imposing uh, diffusivity flow where the um, uh, this weighting, this Markov random field weighting, if, if you think of it that way, depends on this joint field direction. And of course, uh, they, they, we would be uh, inadmissible if we didn't mention machine learning because this is it's, it's escalated and dominating all our thinking. Um, as I briefly mentioned, the uh, transforms, Faster transform can be interpreted through encoding and decoding. The, um, uh, interpretation of the joint probability density can be can invoke machine learning methods to uh, separate into classes, but there's there's a really large 
uh, set of possibilities there. Um, these are some of the references. These are, uh, obviously, we can't look at all of those, but the, the slides are available if you look at those. Uh, these are some of the early emperors, and then uh, here, it, uh, these belong to the um, special issue that um, I mentioned that was appeared in English from the same time here. Um, mentioned a very long list uh, of people, but uh, it would be remiss not to mention my collaborators at UCR and the work I did on the joint entity with Richard Lee. Thank you very much. <laughs>